housing for single adults. Make sure I can click through these slides. Um, so this is Jamie Day, and I am a program and policy analyst here with the Alliance, and I work on issues around homelessness for single adults, including uh, those experiencing chronic homelessness. And I'm joined by Sharon McDonald, um, who will be helping us with the Q&A portion um, of this webinar. And this webinar is part of a rapid rehousing series, um, which has talked about families in the past, um, and there are future webinars coming up, and there will be a newsletter released tomorrow with more um, information on rapid rehousing. Um, so, so I'm going to start with a brief introduction on single adults that experience homelessness. Single adults are the uh, largest subpopulation of those experiencing homelessness. They make up nearly half of the population. And this excludes those, um, those adults who are chronically homeless, as you can see here. And if you look at the trends over time, Single adults uh, have not changed in terms of their size since 2007, um, when the point in time counts uh, were really kicking into gear. Uh, the, there's been a slight decrease of about 5%, um, so not much change, uh, especially when you compare it to those experiencing chronic homelessness, which has been uh, reduced by 30%, and that's due to targeted efforts um, and permanent supportive housing to, for us to see those reductions. And what we know about single adults experiencing homelessness comes largely from shelter studies conducted in the late 90s. Um, and what we found from those studies are that people tend to be male, they tend to be 30 to 50 years old, they're disproportionately African American. Um, and when you look at the estimates of homelessness in terms of time, duration, number of episodes, uh, they vary quite a bit. Um, the other thing that we know about this group is that they have limited access to mainstream benefits uh, because they're not a family with a minor and because often they do not have a disabling condition. Uh, so ultimately, we need more research, uh, specifically looking at what barriers these individuals have to housing, including criminal backgrounds, uh, employment barriers, uh, what sorts of income they have access to, education, et cetera. Uh, some places have been trying rapid rehousing uh, as a solution to ending uh, homelessness for single adults. Rapid rehousing consists of three major components. The first is to find housing for individuals, help them find uh, housing quickly and move in within one month or less. Uh, the second component is to help them pay for that housing with financial assistance um, and help them pay for as long as they need. Uh, and there can be longer term uh, housing opportunities later on. And the third component is uh, to help them stay in housing or case management wraparound services, care coordination. And I think the important thing here is that uh, while rapid rehousing has been focused primarily on families in the past, places are starting to shift gears. And we do have some evidence from the HPRP stimulus program that Rapid rehousing can work for single adults. We've also seen from the SSVF program that rapid rehousing can work for single adults as well. So we are talking today to three panelists who have been using rapid rehousing in their communities uh, for single adults. Um, they include Kelly Kinghorn from Homeward in Virginia, Jean-Michel Giraud from Friendship Place in Washington, D.C., and Kathy Zoll from the New London Homeless Hospitality Center in Connecticut. So the way this webinar is going to work is each of the panelists will do a short introduction about who they are and where they're coming from. And then we have some questions set up, and uh, then we'll do a Q&A session. And then we'll try to save some time later on uh, for questions from the audience. And just to keep us moving along, if we get stuck on something, I'll probably clear my throat rather awkwardly um, so that we'll know to move on. So let's start with you, Kelly. Great. All right. Well, thanks for having me. My name is Kelly Kinghorn, and I'm the director of Homeward, and we are the Continuum of Care lead for the Greater Richmond Continuum of Care. And so we really use a collective impact model in our community. 
And so if we look at the next slide, um, we just want to share from a systems perspective um, our experience with rapid rehousing. We um, have been working at rapid rehousing since 2007. We uh, got some private money to start a rapid rehousing pilot for families uh, even before HPRP came out. Our state um, went in big for rapid rehousing. We had a three-year uh, capacity building grant from a private funder. And we worked with the National Alliance to really increase our capacity uh, to reduce family homelessness through rapid rehousing. We did some learning collaboratives that were really uh, effective. And those uh, information on that is on the website. Um, so we focused a lot on families. And then we, like many communities, really got into SSVF and working with homeless veterans and um, saw some success there. And uh, so on the next slide, you'll see um, now, this is just one year point in time data for us. And um, using rapid rehousing as a primary strategy, our child homelessness was reduced by almost 19%. Um, veteran homelessness came down 11.7%. Now, veteran homelessness includes the work we've done with our HUD VASH and really coordinating those efforts. Our overall point in time count came down by 3.3%, right? So that's all good news. But then we Notice our unsheltered single adults increased by more than 30%. And so that's really the sort of backdrop for our community in thinking about how we could serve single adults experiencing homelessness differently. Because, um, you know, Jamie, your slide at the beginning, we have even more single adults in our community. Um, it's about 75% of our population. So that's our background from that system perspective of why we're interested in this topic. Great. Thank you. So switching gears, Jean-Michel. Yes, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me. I'm Jean-Michel Giraud, the uh, CEO at Friendship Place in Washington, D.C. Uh, Friendship Place is a uh, regional homeless services organization uh, providing an array of services in D.C. and D.C. Uh, metro. We have a lasting impact on homelessness through innovative practices, and we are working to end homelessness by building systems strong enough to catch people on time, um, the array of services I was talking about uh, starts with uh, street outreach, uh, drop-in, uh, shelter, housing first, uh, job placement, a lot of rapid rehousing now. Uh, we're serving uh, singles, uh, youth, families, veterans. We have a $10 million uh, budget and we've uh, doubled our operations in the last 16 months. Uh, 100 staff pretty soon, and we are projecting to serve 2,500 people uh, this year. We started to transform the organization in uh, 2006 uh, by adopting a recovery model throughout. And then in uh, 2008, we embraced the housing first model, uh, which was uh, a great change for us and has now spread through the entire service delivery. In 2011, uh, we started our Rapid Solutions, uh, which have really helped us move forward again by adding new service options for everybody. Um, and that includes for us rapid rehousing, homelessness prevention, and employment first, so job placement, which is key. Next slide, please. So this is our uh, rapid rehousing work. Veterans First is an SSVF program. So it's publicly funded through VA, $3 million for DC and DC Metro. Uh, and then AIM Hire, uh, which we started the same year, which is, uh, has been privately funded, although this month we are adding some public funds from Social Security and uh, DC uh, Department of Human Services. Uh, direct Housing is a program we started on our own uh, two years ago. Um, and it's also privately funded. At Before 30, we serve youth and young adults. It's a blended approach. There is some rapid rehousing there and some other flexible solutions. And then a large uh, uh, rapid rehousing program funded by the District of Columbia for a single. So our capacity overall is to work with 960 households every year. And through this comprehensive network of rapid rehousing 
practices blended with other ones like job placement, we can actually catch pretty much everybody, youth, young adults, families, veterans, and single adults. Next slide, please. So why uh, rapid rehousing? Well, we feel that rapid rehousing and the other rapid solutions are moving the field of homeless services forward. They are, in our eyes, the most recent addition, and they are very uh, important. Um, they are the right programs for the right people, so assessments are, are key, obviously. They add flexibility to our system. They are person-centric and economical. It's a, it's a great model. Um, Everything uh, is based on need, and it's serving the person at the right level of, of uh, services just enough. And the feedback we get, for instance, from veterans who have graduated from the program is that it felt great for them to know that we knew as a system that they only needed a little bit of help, a hand up, in order to be successful again. In other words, we knew that they were resilient enough as a single person or as a household to do well with just time-limited uh, impact from, from the system. We all know that we are, if we're over-serving, we're disempowering because we're giving too many resources, and that's why we find that rapid rehousing is a great solution. Um, and with the demand out there, which is growing due to the aftermath of the crisis, we think that it should be a focus for everybody. Uh, next slide, please. So Jamie asked me to talk a little bit about transforming the organization, since it is what we've done at Friendship Place over the last uh, nine years now. Um, we need to look when we're doing that or about to do that, if that's your case out there, uh, at our culture. Uh, the culture needs to follow, it needs to adapt. We need to make room for the rapid solutions uh, because they fit with some work. So we need to explore, we feel, with uh, participants, uh, board members, volunteers, and staff, and move toward a yes culture, which is what we have implemented at Friendship Place. Recognize also this empowerment piece that I talked about, how people feel about this, how they internalize the fact that programming is done just the right way, at just the right level. Um, we need to uh, select and train uh, staff who are going to be energized. And uh, from the directors who do this out in the field, it seems that a blend of the clinical and the practical is really very important uh, in that there is a lot of practical work, hands-on work to be done in rapid rehousing. But the clinical aspect is also very important, of course. And people need drive. Uh, we need to recognize that this is, this is a time-limited approach, uh, so the clock is ticking. I'm going to go back to that. Um, people have to adjust their expectations. The model, this is not PSH, uh, so there's only so much we can do within this time period, but it's at the same time, it has to get done, of course. People receiving the services, participating in services, need to understand that also. We are finding that employment first is a perfect match for housing first and therefore uh, rapid rehousing, since rapid rehousing is housing first. And by employment first, we mean that we look at everybody as being employable. So we assume employability and move to our job placement as quickly as possible. So this is a fast, intensive service delivery with rapidly achieved outcomes and the clock I was talking about is ticking faster, we are finding, than before throughout the organization, meaning that administration and finance have got to follow, checks have got to be produced in record time, and the idea is that if you're signing a check today as the CEO or COO, you might get a, a person housed tonight, which is really, really important. So everybody's got to keep their eyes on that, on that prize and the goals we're trying to achieve and uh, has got to push very hard. Um, Right-sizing expectations is something we recommend, again, in terms of the service cycle, which is short with some housing goals and other goals to be attained uh, quickly, but also to look at retention measurements 
for instance, 90-day retention measurements are really great. 90 day, between 90 days and 180 days, it's still okay. Beyond 180 days, there is more of a challenge, and we need to be working with funders, for instance, if you have private funders, to accept that this is not the old system where the population stays in place longer. This is a mobile population, and we don't think it's a bad sign sometimes if we don't hear back from people, because in fact we do hear back from people who need us, and we have these, this open door philosophy, so always come back to us even after graduation. We'll always be there to, to help you. In order to bring this up, we are building relationships on around that also, letting people know that it's very important for us to hear back uh, from them so that we can document their retention. But again, working with funders, public funders, private funders, to make that shift and uh, adopt the new model, understand what it's about. And of course, um, we are all learning to consider this as a short-term intervention which has a permanent impact on people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see if my mouse still works. Um, Kathy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my name is Kathy Zoll. I'm the Executive Director of the New London Homeless Hospitality Center. And for any of you that don't know, New London's at the end of that arrow there. Um, we're on the eastern part of Connecticut, a region of about 275,000 people. Uh, we began in 2006 when our city's uh, uh, city council eliminated the Department of Social Services. Um, in the hopes that if there were no services for homeless people, they would all go someplace else, uh, which obviously didn't work out. Um, but a number of us really felt like we had to step in. So our places really very much grew from a community effort. Uh, we began with just mats on a church floor uh, for winter nights, and then we've kind of we've grown since from there. And really from the very beginning, um, our sort of founding sort of ethic has been radical hospitality, uh, to be open to all uh, in adults in need uh, with as few barriers as possible. So the next slide. What we have now is uh, a 40-bed emergency shelter. That's it um, on the left-hand side there. And that's our men's dorm on the top. Um, Again, only adults, uh, 40 beds, low barrier, so we do not allow, of course, uh, substance abuse um, or drugs to come into the shelter, uh, but we welcome people who are still struggling with uh, alcohol or addiction or a variety. We have a lot of people that come direct from prison, still in their prison clothes, uh, to our front door. Uh, we work very hard. We take everybody the very first night. Um, it, so you always have a place to stay until we can have a chance to, to do an intake. So a very, trying to be a very, very open uh, setting. Our focus is rapid exit, but without using time limits. Uh, we don't have any fixed time limit on how long people can stay in the shelter, but since July 1st, we've had 400, 575 exits. That's not 575 different people. Um, because some people might come through more than once. And as of last week, of the people uh, in our shelter, less than 6% had been there 60 days or more, which is a big improvement. The second thing that we have at the few pictures there at the bottom is a daytime hospitality center. And that's a place where people can just come and sit and get a cup of coffee, take a shower, laundry, phone, mail. Uh, we have computers, we have socks, we have sunscreen, we have band-aids, and, you know, connection to a, a lot of different services. And on a busy day, we can have uh, as many as 100 uh, people who come through our hospitality center. Some of those people are staying in the shelter, some are still living outdoors, some are living in their cars for a variety of reasons, and some are actually um, housed maybe stably or unstably, but um, we've kind of become a place where they feel comfortable uh, coming. And we also run our rapid rehousing program from uh, this daytime hospitality center. Uh, the next slide, if we could. 
Just a couple things um, uh, else about our site in general. Uh, we are the front door for our coordinated access um, program in our county. So we have staff from several different um, agencies in our coordinated access network. And since July 1st, we've done 881 intakes. Um, so we're really quite, uh, quite busy. Uh, we've really been working hard on diversion, um, done some special training and uh, special process and special space and funding to try to make that effective. And then we also have what we call our help center, um, a bit along the same lines of empowering people. No appointment needed. You know, come in, tell us how we can, can help you. And uh, we have money, we have people, we have computers, uh, we have resources. Again, just to, again, encourage people to take uh, control of what they need. And then finally, we won't talk too much about it here, we are experimenting with shared housing. We have uh, a couple buildings that um, we have people that are sharing apartments and really experimenting uh, with that model. Thanks. Great. OK, so now this mouse never wants to, OK, here we go. Um, now we're going to just rattle off some questions for you, the panelists. Um, so the first set is going to be around um, why are you shifting gears and using rapid rehousing for homeless single adults? Um, and what outcomes have you seen so far? So Kelly, from a systems perspective, um, what made you shift things towards single adults? Well, so I shared that in Richmond and in Virginia as a whole state, we really focused a lot on rapid rehousing. But even I would say from the beginning, we were thinking, OK, how could we translate this program model to serve single adults. We knew we had really poor housing outcomes for single adults. Um, and we also knew that because the numbers were so uh, big that, you know, 75% of people are not in families, are not accompanied by children, we didn't want to lose public support. We talk about ending homelessness, but to still see those big numbers. And so you see on this slide some of our numbers, right? So again, we're, um, we're a smaller community. Our point in time count is just over 800 now, down from a peak of 1,150 a few years ago. So we served 1,900 single non-veterans last year in our entire COC. We have eight localities. We, we have approximately 300 to 350 new clients each quarter, but 25% of the people served in emergency shelter last calendar year of singles um, served by our emergency shelters last year have been system engaged since 2009 or before, right? So just looking at our numbers, we know we're not doing the job, right? So I, both of the other panelists have shared how they experimented and trying something different and system transformation. And I mean, this is, if you look at your community, and I don't think we're doing a particularly poor job. I think it's just very difficult. And um, we have to figure out how do we try something different. We also know, um, and this has come up once, that with single adults in particular, we have to engage different system partners, right? So we looked at our data and looked at the Richmond City Jail and found that one third of adults served by shelters and not, not even outreach are incarcerated at the jail within the same 12 months as their shelter stay. So for us, it wasn't prison reentry, but it was the local jails that we had this really revolving door in our community and all of this data sort of taken together and the success we were seeing with rapid rehousing for families with children and veterans, I mean, that's what set the stage for our community to say, OK, let's at least fail differently. Great. Uh, Jean-Michel, you said that you have used um, rapid rehousing for veterans. Um, how have you shifted gears um, and why to focus on non-veterans? Well, um, the need was there. What happened in D.C. is that in uh, 2008, uh, the city embraced the housing first model and under uh, the mayor then, and a lot of people went in. Um, some of the shelters were emptied, but we found ourselves a couple of years later in a situation where under a new administration, very few resources were being created, certainly not at the same pace. So that was one uh, recognition. And then 
the folks coming in, the, the pressure was there on the system at Friendship Place, seeing people come through the door, but also realizing that these folks did not need permanent supportive housing and they needed other solutions. So uh, that year, as I mentioned, we started our SSVF program, Veterans First, and we also uh, started the job placement program, Aim Higher. We're now doing rapid rehousing with singles who are not going back toward employment and who are, so we've really blended the approach. But the idea was that we needed solutions for folks who could go back to work, we needed solutions for folks who did not need long-term PSH, and we were starting to uh, question um, whether some people going into PSH really needed uh, such long-term assistance. And again, to empower, you have to serve at the right level. And if you're giving uh, too many resources out to a person, then you're sending a message that that person needs more. And in, t in turn, you're, you're working to disempower. So you have to be very careful. You also have to work economically. And these uh, new solutions do help us do that because they're time limited, they are economical, and with the pressure on the system here, we're now able to serve many more people uh, than before. To give you an idea, here just at Friendship Place, we served 450 people in 2006 and with the adoption of the Rapid Solutions, again, we'll be looking at about 2,500 plus people. Uh, for, for this year. So we think this is the right service for the right people again, uh, so it's person-centric, and it's the right service uh, in relation to what's going on out there in DC and the region uh, in terms of the economy, um, the issue uh, with uh, affordability, uh, with, with jobs, um, and for us, it's become really a logical uh, choice because it works. Great. Going back to Kelly, um, it may be early days, but uh, any outcomes that you're seeing so far in your system? So um, we have really just started focusing on single adults in the last year. And I would say the first outcome, and this isn't qualitative, is that the case managers know that this is possible. Um, we did a small pilot to house uh, single adults coming out of our hypothermia shelter, our cold weather shelter. And that historically has been, you know, it's temperature dependent like many communities have. Historically, 100% of the clients who use that shelter exited the homelessness, 100%. Uh, and this year we don't have all the data yet, um, even though it's 100 degrees and winter's over. Um, but 50 people through this coordinated effort exited to permanent housing. And while it's been difficult, I mean, it's, that's 50 out of uh, maybe 600 individuals who would have otherwise just gone back to the streets um, in the shelter. So I think we're beginning to see it. I think we'll see the results um, in the next, when we look back a year. So. Mm, great. But, but, the, but the biggest change, I think, is attitudinal. Right, we now have case managers saying, oh, well, how could I house that person? They walk down the street and say, oh, I saw a guy and I wanted to house him. And that's the biggest piece, really, is thinking that mm. it's possible. Great. Let me move down. Um, so looking at the approach uh, for serving homeless single adults, uh, turning to Kathy, uh, what strategies do you use um, with single adults? Basically, when someone walks in the door, what's your process for applying rapid rehousing, and what sorts of outcomes have you seen? Well, I think the, uh, the first thing is, is to create uh, expectation about housing right from the start. And this is a very good thing about diversion. I mean, obviously, there are people that you divert from the shelter. But I think it's sort of also, even for a person that ends up having to be admitted to the shelter, from the very first interaction you've had with that person, you've talked about housing as being the, the outcome. And I think that's very important to have that continual focus on housing. The second thing that I would say is, um, for us, is really important to have all options on the table all housing options on the table. And this has been a bit controversial with some of my housing colleagues, 
but we talk to people about, could you stay with a relative? Do you have a friend that has a spare room? What about boarding houses, sober houses, uh, shared housing? In other words, um, obviously what we want for every person is for them to be able to afford to have their own apartment, their own bedroom, bathroom, and kitchen, and I think that's the goal. But I think for many of the people that we're trying to serve, we have to also just really understand uh, the other housing options, obviously only safe ones, but the other housing options in, in our community and talk with people about those things. The third one I would just point out is um, shelter rules that encourage housing. One of the dangers is that for some people, shelter becomes uh, the cheap alternative to housing. And we have a requirement in our shelter that you have, if you have income, you have to save a percentage of that income while you're in the shelter uh, to be used towards housing. And this is important because it sets right away that we're here about housing from the very first minute. So if you have a $200 a week job, you're going to put 30% of it in a savings account that you're going to get back uh, when you get housed. But again, I think it reinforces that the whole idea of that we're about housing. And then finally, really important that's also been touched on is to have the kind of services that people need. The housing location is really critical. Uh, the help center, um, gee, I need to get uh, my license renewed. I need to you know, get a pair of clothes. I can go to an interview. And then financial assistance, which I know there's whole webinars on how to structure financial assistance. But you really have to have some money that you can help quickly um, help people access in order to get into housing. Great. Um, one quick follow-up question. Do you uh, tend to wait any period of time before you approach uh, folks with the actual financial assistance? Um, or is there, is it just a... No. As per, no, but as again, per, again, and I think this is a, a very difficult thing. We, we need for people who have income to use some of that income towards housing because we don't have uh, that many resources. Uh, but we don't wait, no. I mean, if we can divert somebody before they even come into the shelter, we'll make a certain investment at that point. Uh, but, but the key is, is rapid. The rehousing rapid is probably a, a absolutely key. Great. Um, so turning to Kelly, uh, you spoke earlier about sharing data with the jail system and understanding how many people are, are crossing over. Um, how do you incorporate other mainstream services into your system? Well, I think um, one thing that, that our community has done that has been helpful and is just beginning, I think, to bear fruit is to really look at um, tailor each problem and the partners engage in that conversation. So, um, you know, Richmond's not that big, um, but we still, so when we worked with veterans, right, we really brought together, you know, our VA hospitals, you know, veteran serving organizations, partners who were already touching that population in our community. Uh, and so when we're looking at our neighbors who are single adults experiencing homelessness, we brought together uh, different partners. And we, we started, we just looked at our old point in time data, right? So for years and years and years, one of the biggest, uh, two of the biggest data points around single adults have been uh, the lack of employment, right? So 80% of homeless adults in our community are unemployed. And just over 70% have been in jail or prison. And so we use that as a starting point to say, okay, if we want to get to sort of the root cause of this issue and really get some traction and help our neighbors get into housing, we've got to trace the problem back. And so that's why we then approached our jail and our local criminal um, justice partners to see what we could find out and really start to partner with them in different ways. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're at the cusp also of working with employment. Um, you know, but it does mean that some other partners who are important in other conversations aren't as engaged in this one. So I think part of it is recognizing, um, you know, we say like we're trying to eat an elephant, but you can't eat it in one day, right? So uh, the biggest ones for single adults are employment, um, criminal justice, and then really thinking about substance abuse and, you know, what is that network of other community resources and how do they fit 
into our framework. Um, so th that's, those are the pieces that we've looked at. In our state, social services is really doesn't do much for singles. Um, you know, so so it looks different, and being okay that it looks different, that each uh, group that we look at is going to be a little bit different uh, composition. Excellent. So many uh, many folks are shifting gears uh, with rapid rehousing to expand to serving single adults, um, and they're shifting from serving families and veterans. Um, and so really what we're trying to understand is a lot of what you mentioned, Kelly, just now, um, what's different about serving single adults? Um, so Jean-Michel, have you seen much of a difference in serving non-veterans compared to veterans, uh, both with the resources that you use and in terms of your programmatic approach? Well, we've seen some difference, yes, Jamie, um, and we think the differences are inherent to, of course, the groups uh, we're serving, but also to the systems and the way they're set up. So let me go a little bit into this. Uh, for instance, we, of course, are seeing uh, traits from military culture on the veteran side, self-reliance, uh, people, once they have a, a plan, really uh, working through it, uh, pretty quickly for the most part. Um, that has allowed us, for instance, to work with folks at Veterans First with uh, zero income and to bring them to self-sufficiency uh, pretty much in record time uh, on the prevention side, 91 days. On the rapid rehousing side, 127 days average. Um, and the studies, as some of you out there know already, show that uh, some of the work uh, remains to be done once people graduate, of course, and that these households on the veteran side show time after time that they're very driven to keep the housing and that they keep working at it, maybe adding some hours or a part-time job, some form of income. So that's been really interesting. Um, we also see, of course, I think everybody knows that, that the community responds to uh, the fact that we're working to help veterans has been great. Uh, so on the uh, employer side, because of course uh, veteran services for us include uh, job placement. On the landlord side, uh, a willingness to, to help vets is quite obvious. People are coming forth and helping us uh, help uh, the folks. Um, so as a system, um, I think we need to draw some lessons learned uh, from that. And, um, you know, I'm encouraged, uh, for instance, by the fact that uh, on the advocacy side at the national level, um, chronic homelessness and veteran homelessness have been sort of merged and that we're working to end both. Uh, therefore, we're uh, building up on the momentum that uh, the VA side had gained over the last few years because it goes something like, you know, you have been helping us uh, with vets for a landlord. Will you help us with the rest of the population now? And all the way up the system from landlords, employers to people who make, you know, the decisions in the states and, and here in D.C. So it's, we think it's really important to build on that. Um, in terms of the systems, we are seeing very different things because, as you know, some of our service delivery is privately funded, so there we've crafted our own solutions um, ongoingly, uh, listening to uh, participants always, of course, to build the, uh, these practices. Uh, some are more set, even on the uh, district side, like at home now, um, which is rapid rehousing for uh, singles, and then at, at Veterans First. So the systems are different. And again, on some feedback from, you know, talking to the directors who supervise the teams is that um, on the veteran side, uh, the system is very comprehensive. It's uh, very coherent and flexible. Um, so we think that there are some lessons to be learned from that side. Um, and of course, there is amazing uh, work being done throughout uh, here in the district on uh, the other sides of operation, but um, that's what we've seen so far. Great. Um, Kelly, how have you shifted resources in your community um, in order to serve single adults? Right. So 
Uh, in addition to bringing different partners together, and I think I have a slide on this. Um, oh, you do. Yes. We, you know, like I mentioned, we reached out to private funders because that gives us flexibility to address single adults. Um, you know, uh, Kathy mentioned experimenting with shared housing. That's something that some of our um, case management partners have done is trying to figure out, okay, well, how is someone going to sustain that housing? It may not be an apartment of their own. Um, we also are working as a with our state funding, which is not a lot of money, but um, in part because of the work with families, they've shifted some funding to encourage rapid rehousing, and yet they've been flexible about the target population so that local communities can really tailor that package of funding to meet the needs, right? So in Virginia, our community has way more single adults than uh, households with children experiencing homelessness. And that's true in some communities across the state, but not all. So that's a really good way to approach it from that system um, funding perspective. I mentioned earlier that we did a pilot to house single adults at our cold weather shelter, a really a coordinated exit approach. Um, we, like a lot of people, are working fast and furious, or not very fast, actually, but serious on coordinated entry and you know copying something from our work with veterans of really forming a singles housing team what's been so successful with the veterans besides having the housing resources right which is really number one far and away but having that coordinated approach to um, you know as Kathy mentioned what's the housing option that will work is it permanent supportive housing rapid rehousing or something else and then I just shared this last point on this slide, uh, something at our state level that's really sort of resonated across multiple um, housing-related issue is methodology of doing a boot camp. Like really, you know, you can talk about rapid rehousing, and then you just have to do it, right? So part of Virginia's efforts on family homelessness was to do a 100-day challenge. How many families could we rapidly rehouse? And we, you know, we did it over the winter holidays. And so it was that immediate feedback um, of success. I mean, I think the clients reported, as um, Jean-Michel reported, like they felt empowered, that you realize that it will work, that people are resilient. So doing that boot camp or that sort of a blitz model, then coordinating the resources you know, through the housing team, and then integrating the services to, to build your system so it keeps going. And those are sort of the big picture changes I would say in addition to reaching out particularly to criminal justice and employment. Great. So I think what a lot of people are going to be interested in um, is what have been the challenges that each of you has faced um, in applying rapid rehousing to this particular group. So I think we'll start with Kathy. And Kathy, um, specifically in your experience, is there anyone that you would not target with rapid rehousing? No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I think um, we, we've seen rapid rehousing work, uh, even for people with no income, people with a whole variety of challenges. And if it doesn't turn out to be the right intervention, you know, kind of a progressive engagement approach, we'll find that out. Um, but I think again, rapid rehousing is a tool um, that that can work for a lot of people. There are some challenges, and I just would would highlight a few. I mean, there's obviously um, the people that we should all be rapidly rehousing without any question. I, I consider it shelter malpractice <laughs> not to be doing these people, which is people who are working and veterans. But then we come down to another um, categories of people who, who are more of a challenge. We've all talked about lack of income, uh, which is a serious problem. We have many people with very limited income. And I would just throw a few ideas on the table here about lack of income, in addition to, of course, helping people to find work, which is to really think creatively about sources of income. Um, we've had family members, for example, that that didn't want to help out their son or their their cousin directly because they didn't know what was going to happen. But if we had enough time to really plan something, they were prepared to help uh, with us as an intermediary. So that's just an example of another source of income that we sometimes don't think about. A second sort of source of income that we work very, very hard on is our local mental health agency. Um, when deinstitutionalization happened, at least here in Connecticut, 
mental health authorities were set up. And part of the mission of those mental health authorities was to help people be able to live in the community. And that includes helping with housing resources. So we have been very aggressive, and our partner on the mental health side has been very open to this, of saying to people who are connected to the mental health system, to the mental health authority, you need to step up with housing resources to help with these individuals. And that's made a huge difference. And then the final one I would say is our public housing. Um, all of us have public housing in our areas, and sometimes uh, the individuals very limited income are hard to get into public housing, but again, with the right um, advocacy and, and some patience, that's another source of, of housing um, and subsidized housing for any that, that people that are elderly. The second big challenge for us is people with a bad um, landlord history, people who've destroyed apartments, uh, set fires is the worst. Um, and the challenge there is to, landlords are starting to want these multiple security deposits, which we just can't afford. So this is kind of an open question for us, which is how can we find a way to work with landlords to say we know that some people who will place have a, a very checkered housing history and we want to share that risk with you. But, but we have not yet honestly figured out exactly how to do that, but I think that's another major challenge and some opportunities. And then the final um, population I would just hold out for a moment is people struggling with substance abuse and mental health. And one tool that we've used there is becoming a representative payee for people who have Social Security. I mean, I know it's, it is a bit of a nightmare uh, to think about doing it, um, but there is, you can be an organizational representative payee. And we probably now have a dozen people who were in and out of housing over and over and over. And because we are now their payee, um, they're stably housed. And then this intervention with case management and how to parcel that out so that it's cost effective but helpful is the other um, issue that we're sort of still struggling with with this kind of subpopulation. Thanks. Um, Jean-Michel, uh, what have been the challenges uh, that you've seen so far with this group? Well, we've seen some, Jamie. Uh, first of all, to uh, brand uh, the new the new program, the new solution, since this was, you know, just starting uh, in 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 the district, and to message around it uh, so people buy in the the partners we we need, the landlords, the funders, the other folks who support us. Um, because this is uh, DC, of course, we're looking at the challenge with affordability, and we have to get creative around that. We have to engage landlords, for instance, who are in sections where their own uh, units are staying on the market longer because people are staying doubled up. So you might have two or three uh, generations in the same house where the young people are not going out to rent and, and the landlords are really interested in, in working with us or uh, with people who have SSI, for instance, such limited income to engage families and these families need to uh, pay their mortgages, so they clean up a room or two and take in somebody, and that person becomes a part of, of the family. That's been a solution. Um, we've seen some resistance in, in the press, uh, in the media, um, because of the misunderstanding between the fact that we're not a, a part of family uh, rapid rehousing and family uh, rapid rehousing got some negative coverage. So we've, we've had to highlight the fact that we're working with singles and that, that on the family side, people are striving to do, to do better. Um, on the consumer side, we are seeing sometimes that with some people uh, possibly a, a tendency to become dependent on the system and you do have to keep clarifying what the goals are because for some people the vouchers may become something that would be tempting and uh, they actually don't need them and so we have to help people stay on track clinically uh, with that on an individual basis. Um, we keep working to add flexibility to our own system 
um, in the district and the providers are great advocates here and then of course we have this great new administration and key people in place who are really moving things forward so that, that's been great. Um, on the VA side, uh, the Veterans First side, we are seeing that uh, in some instances with other providers the level of case management is not quite the same and we are actually the trainers regionally uh, for the providers so um, in our contract we have a, a training uh, unit uh, for SSVF providers in this area so working with people uh, to do this uh, better and also to uh, look at SSVF as not, as not just a financial tool uh, but of course understanding that a lot of support needs to go uh, along with, with the housing piece. Um, very technically, for those of you out there who are doing the work, uh, some folks are giving people two to three choices only and then the feedback has been again uh, on that side that in order to get more buy-in from people we have to give them more options, not limit their, their choices. Um, in because that can impact negatively after uh, people are placed, some people feeling that they actually cannot afford the places where they are. So key to listen, of course, to people, uh, build with consumer voices. Um, from our employment side, which is now, you know, at uh, Veterans First, at home now, at uh, AIM Higher, of course, the realization that housing first and employment first go in, in hand in hand to make rapid rehousing what it is and that when we do place people in jobs and we do that in 60 days at aim higher and then we rehouse in 90 days in that program um, people have to be making uh, living wages and we're often around uh, $13.65 an hour at aim higher uh, on the hourly side and we take out the salary side, on the salary side we have around $50,000 for averages. So to keep an eye on that because people need to make enough money of course to keep up uh, their housing for the long term. Great. Um, and Kelly, finally, um, the question that you had posed earlier which I loved um, was what is keeping you up at night? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, like any other thing that we've been doing over the last six or seven years, you know, change is really difficult. And, uh, you know, when we think about expanding rapid rehousing to house single adults in our communities, the things that, um, you know, keep me up at night are really, you know, trying to work through community conversations on prioritization. Like, do we, um, you know, how do we do that? Uh, how do agencies handle the caseload, um, and that you know that's also connected to our local conversations on housing focused coordinated entry. Uh, you know we've been pretty shelter focused in our COC, and how do we? And yet we have great capacity on the housing side. So how do we flip that to really be rapid, right? Which is the the key term here. Um, you know we've been thinking about uh, where zero 2016 community. So we. We're making progress on veteran homelessness, and you know that that's it looks really good. We have good providers. We've got the political buy-in. We've got the housing resources. Um, but then thinking about chronic, uh, our neighbors experiencing chronic homelessness. You know, does rapid rehousing have a role to play there? We know we have some uh, folks who will never be vulnerable enough to get permanent supportive housing, and so they've been you know in our shelters for a year or more. You know, how do we do that differently? How do we do that in coordination? Um, and finding that line between setting someone up to fail and then, you know, trying something different, right? And then finally, I think um, something that's come up a lot in Richmond that may be happening other places is, you know, as we get better at rapid rehousing and as we expand to serve single adults, we want to make sure that we're not cannibalizing other programs, right? Like, if we're rapidly rehousing, folks without income or folks who may be harder to serve or, you know, we perceive to be harder to serve, we don't want to erode support for permanent supportive housing, right? We know we need that also, right? We know we need to make progress on ending family homelessness, right? We need to do it all, but how do we do it and how do we do, um, you know, approach each sort of subpopulation that we're working with 
and you know stay innovative and keep trying different things and yet you know working all of that together so those are the things that you know keep me going to my hairdresser for gray hairs <laughs> Um, Kathy or Jean Michel, do those things keep you up at night as well? I don't think that that big. <laughs> I think about these <laughs> small practical things. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> well, I, I try to sleep well, so, but uh, yes, there are, obviously we're all concerned with uh, some of these things. We're concerned with, you know, continuing to meet the demand to grow the system to do the very best job we can to engage people and empower them so that we can grow the field and and have you know uh, an impact which is way beyond the area we hope so and th th that's been a focus for us and and the day to day things of course happen too and you know and this is Kelly again if i could just add that while i mentioned the things that um, you know they're difficult I still have to say this is the most exciting time to be working in this field because we've seen the promise of rapid rehousing with families and we've seen it a little bit with singles. And this this is the year that I, I think our point in time count number will drop precipitously, right? I think we will help our neighbors. Like if we can make a few tweaks at, at the system level, our providers for the most part are amazing, right? And they when they really get into doing rapid rehousing, they do find that it is empowering and it works. I mean, not, it doesn't work every minute of every day. It doesn't maybe work for every client, right? So that's the progressive engagement Kathy talked about. But this is going to make a big difference, right? This is the missing piece of our system. And so I just want to say, like, I am an optimist, and we will do this. I mean, it's pretty incredible to think about. Um, We'll do it, but it may look different, right? That, that's my final piece. That's great. Um, I think we wanted to end at least the, the panel portion of this um, with what's working for you. Um, but I also want to say if you have any final thoughts or questions um, that you're wondering if other people are asking out there that are listening, um, uh, now would be a good time. So let's start. I should key you off. Let's start with um, Kelly, and then we'll go with Jean Michel and then Kathy. So I mean, I think just it's really what I said, but um, you know, the same thing with families. It's constantly innovating. It's doing, you know, rapid rehousing and then tweaking it and then doing it more. So we have some really awesome providers, and they are always on their toes, thinking about how do we do this better? How do we incorporate the feedback from the households that we just housed? How do we better uh, do this? So what's working is oh, is never thinking, OK, we, we've done. We have the next program for the next 20 years. Great. Um, and I should say, if there are questions, um, please, for those that are attending this webinar, um, these are great panelists. And if, you, if anything resonates with you or if you have any specific questions, please um, submit them, because we will have time. Uh, for those questions. So Jean-Michel, uh, what do you think is working the best? Uh, yes, uh, well, not working well, and I agree with this, it's very exciting working in the homeless service because we are developing that we work, so it's doing it. Uh, Jean-Michel, I think you're breaking up a little bit. Is anyone yes, else is this better? Room? Okay. There's a bit of an Can you echo. Hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm better? Yes, I hope. We're okay, can you hear me? Yes. Maybe let's go with Kathy and and then come back to you. Okay. Sorry. Wait, it's all right. I think, I think one of the things that's uh, just been very important to me is that we're thinking differently about what we're doing, and I think this is a very important piece. I think. Um, what it means to be a shelter has is really changed, even in the seven years that, that I've been doing this work in a very, very positive way. And one of the ways that's really um, helped me to think about this is to try to really think about the scope of what we're dealing with. And as many people have reminded uh, me and, and others, if you were to take many of the people who are in our shelter there are people who are just as poor, struggling just as much with substance abuse, just as, as much uh, criminal history, who are housed. And so while um, 
I also serve as a minister, and I am very concerned about social justice and the issues of poverty, and we need to be uh, worried about those. I think when I put on my hat to be at the Homeless Hospitality Center, I really stay very focused on our job is to end homelessness. And that that is not, I know, going to immediately lift people out of poverty, and we need to be concerned about that. But I think having a home is that first step that opens so many doors to people that I really feel our responsibility is to stay very focused, like a laser beam, on getting people out of homelessness and into homes. And then that, I think, frees them up, along with a lot of other systems, to make that the next important transition to get out of poverty. And I think in the past, we took on too much in the shelter world. We were going to, you know, solve mental health problems. We were going to solve, you know, really more things than I think were in our real scope of competence. And I think now we're getting more targeted. And I, I think that's going to be for the benefit of the people that we're serving. Excellent. Uh, Jean-Michel, do you want to try again? Maybe yes. is your computer mic on as well? or? It is. It is. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Oh, great, great. Well, uh, I was starting by saying that I agree with Kathy that this is a very exciting time to work in homeless services because we are developing solutions that work and it's great to watch them grow. What has worked for us at the district level here is that working with other homeless services organizations, we've been able to build a, a virtual coordinated entry system for adults. Uh, so that anybody showing up uh, at any of the locations we operate has access to all the resources. And we are using the uh, Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistant Tool, uh, which has been a, a huge uh, improvement because we're able to see what people need, whether it's permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, or just housing. So a great way to prioritize. Uh, what has worked here at Friendship Place, again, training and energizing staff, driving ourselves, pushing ourselves, having a yes culture, really looking for solutions and empowering staff to be, and volunteers, uh, consumers, to be change agents, um, including uh, participants uh, when important decisions are made, uh, we use a phrase that we brought in from on our own of Maryland, the mental health advocacy group, nothing about us without us, and it sort of resonates through the house. Uh, to be very creative, to engage and cultivate landlords, to prioritize job placement and give it uh, its place, the employment first uh, model, and then to get really excited about the work and to share uh, success stories so people see that this does work. Great, thank you. Um, I think what we'll do is open this up for questions um, from the audience. Sharon, any, any questions you want to start the panel off with? Yes, and I think you may have touched on um, some of the questions that I'm going to pose, but maybe if you could provide a little bit more depth or add on to some thoughts you had originally. Um, I've been asked to ask you to talk a little bit about how you are making rapid rehousing work in a housing market. Um, you know, put it in the context of the housing market you're doing your work in, um, and how um, how are you able to help people manage uh, to find housing in market rate housing, absent a long-term subsidy. Well, Kelly, maybe. you want to start off? Oh. Uh, well, I mean, so. Richmond is not as challenged as a, of a housing market as others, um, as some other places. But it's, you know, I think Jean-Michel mentioned consumer choice, that they feel comfortable. Um, but then it also is helping people get connected to the services and employment they need to maintain that. So it's, it's going in with the eye of we don't just want to get them out of the shelter, that they're in housing. It's a range of housing options. It could be shared housing or a roommate. And those are what's going to at least it doesn't have to be their forever home, but uh, stable housing makes a difference. So it's being creative. Uh, 
Well, for us in, in DC, of course, we're a destination uh, city, a destination region, so we have tremendous pressure on the market, both on the employment side and on the housing side. On the housing side, of course, rents continue to go up, and we have many, many people moving back to the district or moving in for the first time every month, and these are the folks who can afford the higher rents, so they drive the market up. Uh, on the job side in the region, employment um, wages have been more or less stagnant for people who have uh, high school diplomas and less. Uh, and the folks again who are seeing the increases are the folks who have uh, BAs and more. Uh, so we have to really look at where we are and then get very creative, as I mentioned, uh, looking to engage landlords who are challenged themselves, who need to rent their units, who need to feel that also that there's a whole community behind these renters. Uh, we brand uh, potential rent renters uh, ten and tenants uh, accordingly. It's about how you present a person, letting the landlord know that we do guarantee X number of months of rent, uh, and um, depending on the program uh, we're looking at. And then to get very creative by, you know, scrubbing uh, the internet, uh, using all the sites uh, that offer um, housing information, uh, working with families to take in people, uh, working on shared situation the way uh, situations the way you are in in uh, Connecticut, uh, very important um, to do that. I'll just say here in New London, um, we, we actually have a housing market with availability, but for a lot of people with very low income, it's still a challenge to afford housing. And while I totally understand and agree with the idea of giving people choices, I have to say that we also sometimes have to have hard conversations with people about what it is they can afford given the, given the income that they have. And that, you know, staying in the shelter uh, for months and months while you try to work your way up the job ladder is just not an option. And so I think what we try to do is to talk to people about this is a starting point. And this may not be, you know, hopefully it's not the end result. But we have to have very, very frank and real conversations with people about what they can afford and, and help people get into a realistic frame of mind about the kind of housing that's going to be their first step. OK, great. So another question that I have is for those who may be listening in who have experience doing rapid rehousing with families, what can you tell them based on your own experience about what's different about serving single adults? What might they need to be prepared for, equipped for, that they didn't have to do for families. Um, does the service delivery system look different? Um, the service delivery system in the rapid rehousing model look differently? Um, do they need tend to need more or less in terms of financial assistance, just based on your experience? Well, what we're finding on the family side at Friendship Place is that the families often need more support. Things have been a bit more uh, complex in terms of, you know, uh, looking at the households and, and the, the needs that are there. Um, we're, we're finding, in essence, that of serving single adults is maybe a, a little bit easier, of course, as a result of that. You're only, you know, working with with one person at a time. That person has some flexibility in terms of what they can do. Are they willing to share with one or two more people, for instance, at least for a period of time? Um, so uh, that that's what we're seeing. And I do agree with Kathy um, that you need to level with people. Of course, expectations are really important. And there again, um, on, on the single side, you know, it's one person making the decision on this, the place to, to live uh, with, with the families around more, more people making the decisions, and that makes it a bit more complicated. Anybody else want to um, jump in? Okay. 
I can go to the next question. Um, a couple of people have asked about um, if any of you have experience with doing this with chronic, um, chronically homeless people. I again, touched upon a little bit, um, but uh, what is your perception? Is this are people uh, who have experienced chronic homeless, chronic homelessness somebody you could, you would consider for your rapid rehousing interventions? So this well, is Kelly. Oh, go ahead, oh. Kelly. No, sorry. Um, you know, when we were doing some uh, planning for coordinated entry last year, one of our biggest ahas actually was um, one of our rapid rehousing providers talking to a permanent supportive housing provider. And, you know, there was some misunderstanding about those different interventions, and they weren't really coordinated um, very well. But they said, ah, you know what, I think we've served people who really needed your intervention. And, and that was mutual. So I think um, we're beginning to see that. Like I said, we've got people sitting in shelter or sitting under a bridge, worse yet, waiting for a permanent supportive housing unit. And, you know, we have to be realistic that they're not going to get it. They're never going to be. Um, the most vulnerable person who really needs that resource. Uh, and so it's definitely something we're talking about now. Yes, and at Friendship Place we would consider, we do uh, place people who are in chronic homelessness through Rapid Solutions. Um, the, I think the, the key piece there is to do a really good assessment so you know exactly what the person's uh, needs are and you can project uh, and, and see what the likelihood of their being successful in that setting is. Uh, but I think you have to keep the door open. Um, one question we sometimes get, you know, is how can you work on job placement with uh, s some of the folks who are coming forth? And again, it's all about keeping your mind open and looking for for the skill set. So it's I think it's a responsibility for all of us to draw from lessons learned and then give people as many options as we can, so definitely. Yeah, I think the all I would add to that is um, the, the discussion about targeting, which I think is, is very important. And the place that, that I've seen rapid rehousing really work is, is not people who meet the HUD definition of chronic, in other words, long-term homeless and a serious mental health problem. But we've had a lot of long-term homeless individuals who really their problem was they couldn't find a job. Um, they wanted to work, they were able to work, but as months stretched on to months, um, they just got more and more disconnected from the labor market. And I think for that population who have been homeless a long time, many of whom are outside or in shelter, uh, rapid rehousing with some some case management support and if we had some employment program like you're doing at Friendship Place, I think that could really be effective. Um, sometimes we end up with permanent supportive housing as the, the only option we can think about for those people that we've just seen year after year in our community. And I do think that many people absolutely need permanent supportive housing, but I think there's also a group of people, and I've actually seen a few situations of people who were unemployed for years and years and years. We rehouse them, a little support, and somehow they found work, and they just took off from there. And so that person, I think, was really very well served by an intervention like rapid rehousing. Well, I have another question. Um, can folks talk about how, if, if and how, they are using SPDAT or other assessment tools either inside their agency or across the community to sort of tailor or identify um, appropriate interventions uh, and appropriate referrals, if that's being done and how? So yes, we are here in uh, Washington uh, as a community actually, and uh, I can give you a little bit of history on what happened. Uh, we went to a uh, and then when we got back, we created, of course, this group that was working on uh, goals, 90-day goals, and so on and so forth. And um, as we were examining also as a group of providers, we knew that we needed something that was sort of centralized but very mobile, uh, so not in one location in terms of coordinated entry. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have built this system 
where many organizations in the city now share uh, electronic information with uh, participants authorization of course and giving these folks access to all the resources that are available through the other providers and linked to that uh, we adopted the uh, VI SPADAT um, to help us because there were again a lot of questions about what people needed as uh, Kelly and Kathy have mentioned, uh, it's, uh, we need to get to very good assessments in order to serve just the right way. And so the VI SPADAT helps us assess people's needs and predict where, where they'll do best. Uh, so it's been a good experience for us. Anyone else we, want to jump in? We use the VI SPADAT here in Connecticut too, statewide. Um, I think we're just starting, so we still we still have to learn from it. Um, one of the the difficulties for me is is some people who score quite low on the VI SPADAT, and who when you you talk to the experts really shouldn't be receiving any rapid rehousing support. I still find it hard because I see people who are getting very very low wage jobs um, just cannot pull together that first month's rent and the security deposit. And so I have to say I'm still struggling intellectually uh, with, with my gut sense that providing a little bit of financial support for people, even with low scores, is a good long-term investment, even though, you know, Ian and the VI <laughs> SPADAT people have a lot of data that would sort of indicate that we shouldn't be giving any resources to those people. So I'm still struggling at that level, but it's a great tool, very usable. It's really helping in many, many ways. So I think we're learning still, though. And just to finish off, we're also using the VI SPADAT uh, in Richmond. We really piloted it with the veterans, and that's, you know, it's that experience that makes us think we can translate it um, for the single adults. Um, so we're having the same conversation, some of the same um, issues that Kathy raised, and I think it's really combining um, across providers that expertise to really look at what's going to be the best solution, and we're incorporating it into our coordinated entry work so that you can look at, you know, the groups of uh, clients that we have, what are the housing interventions, and how do we maximize all of that. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I think one of the reasons, um, you know, that we're looking at rapid rehousing for singles is because we, you know, we know we can end homelessness, but we need public support and credibility to do that. And so you have to make progress on a number of fronts if we're going to have that continued buy-in. Um, and so it is really, you know, it's helping people get off the streets. It's um, people, you know, giving our neighbors more options. Um, you know, coordinating our efforts so that we can really use our resources better and then, you know, based on that to get more resources. So, so the tool is, is, a, is a helpful way for us to do that. But we don't have all the answers, for sure. Uh, and we don't either. We sometimes feel that, you know, between uh, a high score in uh, rapid rehousing and uh, permanent supportive housing, sometimes uh, things get a little blurry and we end up helping people in rapid rehousing who really could use probably longer term assistance. So there, there are some questions, yes. Okay. I have a couple of questions about the logistics of, of your rapid rehousing intervention. If you wouldn't mind each talking a little bit about um, the, the average uh, months of rent assistance you provide and the average um, uh, amount of follow-up case management that you provide and maybe a little bit about the range. Is it pretty much, you know, one size fits all or does it vary widely? So if each of you could discuss those two pieces. Well, I'm happy to start with some averages at Veterans First, which is funded by the Department of Veterans Affairs. We have a $3 million grant and we are working with 555 households in DC and DC Metro. So things are set according to SSVF. Uh, we graduate people uh, in uh, prevention in 91 days, I mentioned that, and in rapid rehousing we graduate people in 127 days. 
um, at a higher, this is a, a privately funded uh, job placement program just accepting its first uh, public funding from the city and social security administration both uh, this month, it's just st starting. Uh, we use the employment first approach and we place people in jobs in 60 days and for rapid rehousing and prevention we, pre we do that in 90 days and we offer a one month subsidy uh, which is limited and uh, we wish we could do more, uh, but it's drawn for, from private funds, so we have that. Um, at uh, Direct Housing, which is also privately funded, um, we uh, house people in 70 days and the service cycle is 165 days. And because this is a relatively new program for us, uh, we started it in May of last year and um, we, uh, it, it grew significantly, in, uh, very significantly just a few months ago. Uh, our graduation uh, time frame is 165 days again. We're trying to reduce that. We think that we, we could do better in that area and we're, we're in conversations with the Department of Human Services uh, to, to work on that. Um, and then at home now, we house people. This is a privately funded, direct, uh, rapid rehousing program working with actually uh, families and singles and folks as low, as I mentioned, as uh, SSI for the income level, so very, very low income. We house in 62 days there and our service cycle with the additional supports just to make sure people are in stay in place and connect is uh, 219 days. And, and I think I had that in reverse, I'm sorry. Uh, 70 days for housing was uh, direct housing, 165 days was that service cycle. Uh, the service cycle for the publicly funded program home now is 219 days and that's why we're working to reduce it. Well, here in New London, um, we we do um, generally one month just because we have so little money. And then the state of Connecticut has what they call a security deposit guarantee program uh, that landlords, if you know they meet the criteria, can collect from the state. So we're essentially trying to do one month of, of assistance uh, plus the security deposit guarantee. And then we do say to people um, that, that they can come back to us in, for a second month. I wish we had more resources and there's other programs in our continuum that provide three months of assistance. And there's even one program in our continuum that will provide even more than that. But for us, it's pretty, it's pretty limited to a month, maybe two months. And in Richmond, I mean, we have a pretty wide variety as well. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, when we did the pilot with the cold weather shelter, um, that agency started with one month, um, and but it, probably three months would not be out of place for singles, and then case management probably three months after that. I mean, I think it's having that connection. I think. Um, the other two panelists have mentioned that you know people need to come back. Some people need to come back, um, but I will say that while um, you know case managers are keeping those connections, we're, we're seeing pretty significantly low rates of um, returns to homelessness after rapid rehousing. Overall, you know our success rate is 93% of people don't return to homelessness. That doesn't mean that they're um, you know, in a great, fabulous situation and that they'll continue to always be stable, but they won't, um, they're not coming back to homelessness, right? They, they've gotten the help they needed. But I would, if I had to say um, probably three months of rental assistance as a starting point, some get more in our community depending on their needs and the program, and then probably three months of case management. But we don't take a one-size-fits-all approach. Yeah. So Kelly, a quick uh, question: um, Where, what kinds of housing arrangements did the people in your cold weather pilot um, shelter yeah. pilot study go? That was that was asked. Yeah. Well, that um, I think that's where um, 
it was probably a room in a house, right? So, uh, which is not uncommon in Richmond, or having a roommate in it with, in an apartment. Um, I mean, it was private money, so that gave us some flexibility. But it looked like housing options for others. So it's working with landlords who are comfortable serving single adults. Um, but it probably this would be different from families. It's probably not a whole apartment, private market apartment, but um, you know, a room and a house that's for rent. Um, so that that'd be the main uh, the main housing option. And if anyone's okay. interested, yeah, they can get more details at the National Alliance Conference because that case manager is doing a session. So I'll just put a plug there. You can hear directly <laughs> from the manager, who's awesome. Yes. Uh, we'll we'll okay, be there also. <laughs> <laughs> Another plug. <laughs> so 93% um, of folks in that pilot didn't return. Does anybody else doing oh, returns? Uh, wait, Sharon, that's across all rapid rehousing programs in the last year. Okay. Yeah. Anybody um, checking recidivism on other single adults? When, uh, when we yes, did a study. Uh, we got 85% um, remained housed, I think, a year yeah. later. John michel uh, Also, yes, from AIM High, for instance, 90% for housing, 80% for employment. So, you know, the, the solutions uh, are, are, are great. They're, they are working. Yeah. So I um, also want to say that um, a, a couple of people have asked, and I know it's going to be um, um, a great topic of interest is, is how are we connecting these folks to employment. But I think we should reserve that for a whole separate webinar. And obviously, you folks are doing really good work with us. So can I turn this over to my colleague to do the closing? Sure, thank you. Um, so I just want to say thanks so much to uh, our panelists. Uh, this is an excellent presentation. Hopefully, it gives everyone um, some ideas, um, some excitement to maybe try uh, try these things with single adults. Um, maybe ask these same questions that we asked our panelists um, of yourselves and your communities. Um, explore, explore how these might work for you. Um, with that, I will um, say farewell. Any other closing thoughts? Good luck. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for including us. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks Thank so you. much. All right. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you.